Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 188, we're going to take a first look at filaments, otherwise known as heaters. heaters. In fact, Charles has got so many um, bench uh, experiments and uh, things he wants to talk about that we're going to call this part one. And hopefully we're going to end it with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You're thinking of blowing something up. Uh, we're going to try to. We haven't tested it yet, so we'll see what happens. Do we need to go get our face shields? Uh, I think we're already wearing them. Yeah, but our <laughs> cheeks are exposed. <laughs> well, well, let's get the caution in here first. First, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. If you followed us for a while, then you've probably heard one of our favorite phrases. The tubes are the amplifiers. And that's very true. But tubes themselves are also an assembled collection of components. We call those mostly electrodes. And many of the uh, options that are available to assemble a tube are... Um, well, they're optional. <laughs> they're optional. <laughs> but with the exception of some very specialized types of tubes, if you have something that's going to amplify, then it needs to have a filament. Also known as a heater. Yeah. And this is just about the simplest form of a vacuum tube that you can have, a light bulb, which is just a heater inside an envelope and it's designed to produce light. With a tungsten filament, yeah? Yep. So let's take a look and see how this works. Okay, now we've got this 200 watt incandescent bulb mounted in um, an old piece of test gear I, I built years ago. It's called a light bulb limiter. And um, I've got, a, as you can see, I've got a dead short across the neutral and hot leg of a standard duplex outlet. And do not do this at home. Don't do it on your bench. Don't even think about doing it. We're just doing it for the show. And um, essentially what I'm doing is showing you what a light bulb limiter is designed to do, which is to, to show a dead short. So um, if you work with uh, a lot of older equipment and you're really not sure when you first turn it on if you've got um, a dead short internally somewhere, then what you do is you plug the equipment into this socket here and uh, the light bulb is in the circuit. So if there's a dead short, what will happen is that it'll lamp the bulb. And uh, depending on how, what wattage you choose and how bad the short is, um, will depend on how much you, you lamp the bulb. So this is not a piece of equipment we ever make much use of because we design and build um, new equipment for the kid amp business and we never have shorts in the kid amp business. So This is also a common feature on some older tube testers too where they used a small bulb as a current limiter and as a fuse at the same time. So if you saw it drawing too much current, you'd see that bulb lamp. Right. And if it drew, drew way too much, it would pop. Right, and you'd probably get your your unit turned off ASAP before you lost another bulb. So I've got I've got the limiter plugged into uh, my bench variac, and that's just the variable voltage device. And I'm slowly bringing the voltage up. I've got 18 volts AC, and as you can see, oh Charles is dropping stuff. Um, as you can see. We're getting brighter and brighter as the voltage comes up. Now, this is a very bright light bulb. So in a minute, uh, the camera uh, sensor is going to get overloaded and we're going to be blind. So so that's about as high as we're going to go with it. Okay, let's bring it down. Okay, so let's reset the bench and we'll take a look at a really specialized tube that's got a thoriated tungsten, which is a really specialized kind of a tungsten. So hang on a second. I'll be right back. Okay, so what do we have here? This is a really interesting four pin directly heated triode. And this is called the 830B. It's actually a transmitting triode. And look at that chunky plate on there. That's just an absolutely beautiful tube. Well, the plate itself is a marvel of design. It's actually made from um, volcanic rock. And I'm, 
I'm not sure if they milled it out of a block or if or they... Maybe it was sintered or something. Yeah, but. it's really... And it, of course, it's designed to handle enormous amounts of heat. And uh, current, yeah. You'll see in a minute um, what we're talking about. So when you, when you thoriate the tungsten, um, I don't think it's a coating. I think what it is is an... Uh, an alloy. An alloy. Mm -hmm. And that allows it to handle uh, current... Quite a bit more. Uh, yeah. And this is a high current filament, so that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So let's take a quick look at the data sheet, and then we'll get to lamping this guy just like the light bulb. Let's bring this in here and grab a poker if I can find one. Oh, there's always pokers. There we go. So on tube data sheets, if you're trying to figure out how to lamp a tube, if you're trying to design a piece of equipment or test it, they will almost always give you the filament information right near the top of the sheet. As the very first thing they want to talk about because it's, it's the first thing that you got to deal with. Yep. Yeah, if you want the tube to run correctly, you have to lamp it correctly. So it'll give us these values, voltage and current. So in this case, this tube is designed to run at 10 volts. And while it's running at 10 volts, it's expected to draw around two amps of current, which is huge for a tube. Most of them are way lower than this. And very typically, they'll let you uh, lamp it as in, with AC voltage or DC voltage. Yeah, if it requires one or the other, it will specifically say so, but most tubes will operate just fine on both of them. So we've got our specs here. And we've got the tube hooked up to a bench DC power supply. I've got it hooked up to the correct filament pins. Oh, actually, that's something else that you'll see on the data sheet. They will give you the pin out and they'll show you. Let's see if I can find it here. They'll show you which pins are the filament. And on a four pin tube, the large pins are normally the filament. And you can see on the schematic, they actually showed the pin schematically as a larger circle. Mm -hmm. You can see these are larger than these guys right here. So it tells you which ones are the filaments. Yeah. So we've got it hooked up and I am going to turn on the bench supply and start feeding it a larger voltage. And we're gonna see how that comes up here. Yeah, so it's on our, it's on my DC bench supply. And it's only sitting at about 2.7 volts right now. And as you can see, it's just barely lamped here. So let's start bringing it up. And as you have a lower voltage, you also have a lower current. So I'm sitting at around four volts now, and I'm just over 1.1 amps, whereas the data sheet said it should be at two. So let's bring it up and look at that glow getting stronger there. We're just passing five volts. Six volts, we're getting up there. And there's 10. Look at that beautiful glow. You don't see that with too many tubes glowing this strongly, but this is a, a very high current filament. And it just has a beautiful glow to it. And it's drawing two amps. Now two amps doesn't sound like a lot if, if, you, if you're used to thinking of amperage at 120 volts AC. Mm -hmm. which, you know, maximum for a typical breaker circuit would be 15, 15 amps for 120 volts AC. But, um, so typically a kettle might be drawing, let's say, 10 amps or 1,200 watts. But here, we're only uh, uh, running it at 10 volts and 2 amps. So we've got uh, 20 watts of, of power just on the little filament in here and you've got a really nice glow to it. So whenever you're running a filament, you want to try and have it as close to the data sheet spec as possible. Now this tube on its data sheet just gives us 10 volts, two amps, but normally what you'll see is a range. You'll see a bottom voltage number and a top voltage number, which is where the tube is designed to run in. And sometimes that voltage will vary if it's in a piece of mobile equipment, say if it's running off of a generator or a governor of some sort, um, or an alternator, I guess I should say. G what Generally speaking though, you probably can safe, well, you can safely shift 5% without even thinking about it. Most cases you probably can shift 10%. And after that, you're starting to get probably on the edge of what would be the specifications. But the data sheet for many tubes will tell you what the tolerance is for voltage. Yeah. 
But most equipment, the transformers that have filament voltages, uh, dedicated filament transformers, are all designed to handle the standard voltages. So 6.3 is the most common. 12.6 is also very, very common. 5 volts is very common. Mm -hmm. 10 is not so common. <laughs> no, no, it's pretty difficult to find transformers with the right taps, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But if you run these at a lower voltage, you're not going to damage the tube. It's not going to perform the way it's supposed to, but you're not going to hurt it. The problem is, is whenever you start running these things at a much higher voltage, and we're not going to do that with this tube because it's this is, working. This it's is a good a, tube. <laughs> it's an expensive tube. In fact, this is a tube that I've said that when I retire, I'm going to build the biggest honking pair of mono, Class A monoblocks that I can. It's going to be a beast. And it'll be my retirement monoblocks. <laughs> I'm not planning on retiring until um, I turn 70. And even then I expect to, to work until 80. But I, I won't work full time after 70. That's my plan anyways. Until then, our, our box of these is patiently waiting. And yes. occasionally we'll pull them out to show them off like this because we just think they're they're beautiful tubes. Yeah, well, I pet them every once in a while. <laughs> okay, let's shut this off here. And we're going to hook up a different tube. We'll be right back. And we're going to show you what happens whenever we bring the voltage up way too high. So, full disclosure, this is... Um, we're actually going to talk about these tubes at the end of the show. Um, this is a, a lovely Marconi uh, early elevated um, T-plate. And... We have, I always keep a bin of what I call dead and damaged tubes. So this is not about, this is not a good tube. So we're not going to be attempting to destroy a good tube. Nope. Never destroy a good vintage tube for any reason. They are getting very rare. Okay. And this is the 6SN7. So it's actually designed to run on something. Well, hopefully you can't hear that, but the power supply fan just turned on. The uh, I'm actually going to bring the lights down in the lab and so we don't even have our studio lamp on but we're going to have no lights in a second. Mm -hmm. So this is a 6SN7 and it's designed to operate on I believe around 600 milliamps at 6.3 volts. Now let me see if I can get that in there. And you've got it lamped at 6.3 volts currently right lamped. now. It's not very bright there it but is. there you can see the filament running there. Now what happens if you plug a 6.3 volt tube into a 12 volt supply. Let's okay. bring it up. Face shields down. Okay, we're coming up and we are now at 12.6. Okay. All right, so our current has gone up. We're at 850 milliamps, where we should be closer to 600. And look at how much that's glowing. That should be your first sign that you've done something horribly wrong if you've got these plugged in the wrong amp or into a tester at the wrong voltage. That's right. If you ever see a bright light, uh, you've got to program your brain to think, off switch, off switch, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. off switch. Quick. Something's gone wrong. <laughs> Occasionally, we've plugged in tubes and we've left them running at lar at higher voltages. And so well, hang on, who has plugged in tubes uh, and left them running? We have both done it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, fair and, enough. And we've killed some. Some have survived just fine, um, but you wouldn't trust them for a, a long time afterwards. I would say. Well, the early Soviet tubes they survive our abuse the most because I think. Uh, Soviet engineers design filaments for the idiots that were... were... <laughs> they design them for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't do it that often. Yeah. Uh, so. Okay, so what happens whenever you're doing this is that you're putting through a lot more current than the filament was ever designed for. And it's probably not going to keep going. It's not going to keep going. The tube is, if it's in operation, it's going to pass more current than it was designed for. So you're going to be putting your, it's going to have higher dissipation, which means that you might end up having a red plate situation. Look at the top. Yeah. Take a look at that. You might eventually melt the filament, but one of the things that's going to happen over time at any higher voltage is that you're going to get tungsten particles flying off that filament and sticking to the glass. And you can already see some of it starting to happen right here, if I can get to focus. You see these black and silvery dots at the top? Some of that is normal, depending on the tube type. So yeah, there's a the, bit of flash off sometimes on them. The EL84, the small nine pin power tube, mm -hmm. uh, is well known for having that. Now that's not a sign of a defect in that tube. It's just that it's such a small bottle and it's so damn hot yep. that it does deposit particles on the glass. 
But normally it doesn't get worse over time. No. Uh, unless if you're running, you know, for a very long period of time. But if you're running it over voltage, something like this, for too long, that that position, you can see it's getting bigger and bigger as we're going along here. I'm going to increase the voltage even more. Should I stand back? <laughs> Look at that glow. Oh my god. So we're up at almost 19 volts here now. I'm just going to leave it here until it's probably going to pop. And Where's the bang? You promised me a bang. <laughs> so the, the tungsten is just going to keep flashing off on the inside here. And what that's doing is that we're slowly losing actual mass on the filament. It's disappearing from it. It's going away. It's sticking to the glass. It's inside the envelope. And eventually it's going to weaken the filament enough that it's going to snap. Now, well, it'll burn out. Right? It'll burn out. It'll snap. Something's going to happen to it. And I actually don't know how long it's going to take at this voltage. Uh, we haven't tested this, as we said earlier. So, well, let's go to 24 volts, and if it doesn't blow up, then I'm I'm bored. <laughs> if it doesn't blow up, I'm going to be impressed. Okay, 22, and because we've over voltage, uh, over voltage six. Oh, there it goes. Look at that. Wow. Okay, that's better than a bang. <laughs> that was, that was a flash. <laughs> <laughs> All right, off goes the power supply, and there is our dead tube. So look at the amount of flashing that happened on the top here. It's actually not that much, but you'd see more over time. And there's, it's hard to see on the inside, but on the glass center piece here, yeah, you probably can't make that out. It's quite a bit darker around the middle, and it's flashed off downwards towards that as well. And we've got discoloration on the glass here too, around the actual gettering. Probably a bit from the heat, but also from the filament. So that's how you kill a filament. <laughs> you run it at too high of a voltage for too long, and you're going to burn it out. So the focus of part one was to show you the importance of making sure that you have the correct filament voltage for the tubes that you're running. Mm -hmm. And it's really important these days, especially as tubes dry up. Uh, older types. You might try and sub something else in for it. You have to make sure that that something else has the right voltage, the right current for the amplifier, or the amplifier can handle the current. What's the most common order mistake in the store these days? Somebody orders a 12 volt tube for a 6 volt system. Yeah. And we're going to try and separate out those tubes, actually, especially in the 6S N7 uh, category coming up here because it's happening way too often. And yeah. it's just because the 12 volt tubes are less expensive. So. Yeah. So, and the, the, in the, in the standard uh, numbering system in, um, in the U.S. for vintage tubes, typically the first number is? Is the filament voltage. So a 6SN7 is a 6 volt tube or a 6.3 volt tube. A 12SN7? It is a 12 volt tube. And funny enough, the Sylvania Loctals, in order to differentiate them, they said that their filament voltage centered on 7 for the 6 volt tubes and 14 for the 12 volt tubes. And they just did that because they didn't want to have a 6 on the front or a 12 on the front. <laughs> but they were the exact same tubes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in fact, they ran at 6.3 and 12.6 volts. Yep. What, what about a 5U4 rectifier? Well, that's using a 5 volt filament, yeah. which a lot of uh, vintage transformers or replacement transformers still have on them. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for doing that, Charles. That was actually more fun than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, it was quite the pop there. Okay, Charles, what what came in this week? Well, actually, not that much, but what we did find was some stock that we forgot we had. <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, you've been searching our own inventory because we have literally thousands of tubes that aren't in the store that yep. are in our inventory. And there's more coming. I mean, we're finding stuff that, uh, that we just don't have in the store all the time. So I found some really interesting 6SN7s the last time I was in our miscellaneous bin, and I thought I'd show them off. And... Um, Essentially, it's these little short bottles right here. Let's take a closer look at one of them. And what this is, is a 6SN7 GT straight plate made by Sylvania. And it's got a lot of the features of their very early tubes. It's got the back-to-back the -back straight plates, the big chrome dome on it, but it has a short base, which is a little odd. And you can see, well, maybe not on this one, but you can clearly see we've got a 6SN7 GT on top. 
Now the GTs typically had tall bases like this guy over here. So these were probably built with a short base and a short glass for a very compact application. Somewhere where they had to fit them in a tight space. In fact, we've seen the Loctal version, which we do have quite a few of, um, uh, that were mil-spec tubes. Yep. And these ones were probably built off the same hardware. You can actually see similar micas in here where they used to have a support post or it was designed to have that in these. So are you saying that this is a short bottle of Sylvania bad boy? Uh, I believe so. And to compare it to, we've got a tall bottle 12SN7 version of it. And they're very, very similar tubes. They're both made by Sylvania right around the same time. These are actually both, well, this one is at the very least is a military label tube. And they're very similar. We've got some slight differences on the mica. We've got two holes on the plates here versus three on the other ones, but Sylvania made both. And yeah. they're very similar sounding tubes. I listened to a small number of these that I found on the prototype testing preamp, and they had all that wonderful Sylvania warmth and balance to the sound. Now, the, 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 the Bad Boy 6SN7 GT is basically an extinct tube now, unfortunately. Yeah. We still, luckily, have, in fact, this is a 12-volt tube here, we still mm -hmm. have good inventory of, believe it or not, of new old stock um, 12 SN7 GTs. Now, a couple of cautions. You can't use a 12 SN7 in a 6 SN7 uh, socket, right? We just finished talking about that. It's not going to damage the tube, but it's not going to run right. No, it won't run right. It won't, it won't glow beautifully either. Um, and you can't use the early first generation lower spec uh, GT in most modern amps they'll get damaged and noisy. Um, but there are some exceptions. We actually design the 6 or 12 SN7 universal kit preamp specifically so that we could play the early uh, 6 SNs and early 12 SN7 tubes. And they sound amazing. Yeah, it's worth putting in the effort to design around these. And hopefully more amp manufacturers are going to do that since these are um, basically the last ones left, the 12 volt versions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, what else have you got, Charles? Okay. Well, along the same lines... Let me just clear the decks here. We've got another very similar looking tube. And this is the Marconi Canada produced 6SN7 GTV. And you can see not a lot has actually changed between... Let's bring that GT yeah. back in here. Not a lot has actually changed between the early GT and the GTB on these Marconi tubes. They still have the same plate structure. The same general layout, although we've got a short base on it, and lighter gettering. I mean, the strong flashing here is is um, really a bad boy kind of thing, a Sylvania sort of thing. Yeah, I'm pretty sure actually that the Marconi tube is probably probably predates the Sylvania because Marconi held many of the primary patents for vacuum tubes, mm -hmm. and in fact, um, when RCA was formed. Um, GE purchased um, uh, Marconi USA so that I believe so that they could get perhaps the manu some of the manufacturing capabilities but I suspect that the the main reason they bought in was so that they could get their hands on the patents yep and all the uh, the very earliest 6SN7s had this plate structure so it's something that just stuck around with the Marconi design yeah the the early photons the Soviet made tube um, that we've uh, promoted for years now, uh, which is a 6SN7 GTB, which is mm -hmm. the, the last uh, version of the tube, a more modern spec tube, uh, also say, shares many of the same sonic attributes. So there's something about when you elevate uh, the plates that gives you uh, an open, airy, um, almost a live sound. And I think that substantially because you've got the uh, plate structure up on essentially a stock. It's gonna be more prone to have um, uh, vibrations and uh, it's gonna produce a whole series of probably harmonic distortions. Mm -hmm. Along with that does come some more noise and microphonics. Uh, so we were very careful with weeding these tubes out. Um, That's right. I mean, this style of assembly typically has more noise problems than one in which the 
uh, plate structure is uh, down lower. And th I think that explains pretty much why the modern GTA and then later GTB tend to have their plate structures much closer to the base. Yeah, and in a shorter bottle, yeah. But sonically, though, I mean, the, the trade-off, of course, is you, you, you trade off uh, the risk of a noisy tube mm -hmm. or even perhaps a, a slightly higher noise floor uh, for just wonderful sound. M more harmonics. <laughs> more harmonics. And uh, more harmonics means that you fill in the sound, particularly in the mid-range, and it can make a huge difference. If your system is sounding flat, you want a, you want an earlier tube. Yep, and that's something that the bad boys are known for, and I believe it's something that these Marconis are starting to get known for too, is having a really nice mid-range and some great warmth. Yeah, in fact, Charles found a large, large um, supply of them years and years ago, and we went through thousands of them, I think, finding the good ones. I think I spent a solid month <laughs> sorting, cleaning, testing and tossing a huge number of them, but we found the best ones, matched them up, and they're in the store. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks for doing that, Charles. And if you stay till the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. And people are regularly grabbing a hidden code that's pretty easy to figure out. And we can reach almost everybody around the world for a flat rate $20. And if yours $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.